a warm welcome to all the speakers and participants. I am Dr. Subhash Hira, moderator of webinar learning series that is launched by the Global COVID-19 Network. As uh, COVID scientists and warriors are being flooded with tons of information about of varying quality through publications and the social media, scientific webinars are becoming more credible source of reliable information. Some both the research and communication organization, Indian Social Responsibility Network, New Delhi, and the University of Washington, Seattle, have co-sponsored this global network to foster South-South collaboration and partnerships to share lessons of COVID-19. Mr. Sudhanshu Malhotra of Sambodhi and Mr. Santosh Gupta of Indian Social Responsibility Network are also connected with us today. Welcome to our co-sponsors. As of 2nd June 2020, the cumulative world case record count of COVID has recorded over 6.4 million people infected with COVID-19 and just over 380,000 have lost their lives. That is the fatality rate of about 6% compared to, that is a global fatality rate compared to that, the national Indian fatality rate is 3%. I will be very brief to recap the fifth webinar that was happened last week on the 26th of May. It explored the theme of personal and institutional protection and prevention with speakers from Italy, the UK and India sharing regional experiences. The core issues pertaining to the predominance of physical distancing norms over and above the mask wearing and ad adopting workplaces of increased safety, those were discussed. The resumption of schools was discussed as the end phase of opening up. Additionally, the anecdotal data and the potential of homeopathy treatments for prophylaxis against COVID-19 that has been endorsed by the national and state Ayush uh, ministries of health uh, of India, they were discussed the importance of holistic healthcare as well as well-being were emphasized. So that today's seminar, the sixth in the series, is titled Social and Economic Impact of COVID-19. I will explain the slide that is visible on the screen, which shows different levels of lockdown restrictions in different countries. The blue halo or the pink halo or the red halo around the national flags. Please see the quadrant one, where on the left upper quadrant is written one, where Vietnam and uh, Indonesia, they seem to have a yellow, a blue halo, meaning that these countries had a restrictive, limited restrictions while the quadrant two, which shows down there, India also having blue halo, which meant that they had uh, low restrictions in terms of lockdown. But next to it also is South Africa, which shows a pink halo, which means there are moderate restrictions. And Argentina as a country shows a red halo, which meant that Argentina had very high level restrictions, severe restrictions. The quadrants are made up of two axes. The vertical axis, it represents the economic outcomes till the last week. And they use the indicators like uh, GDP and the industrial agricultural production indicators. The horizontal axis it showed the public health outcomes using the number of uh, report cases, the fatality rate and social outcomes. So the slide is a 
electoral representation of socioeconomic outcomes of COVID-19 in the countries of the world. So now look at what is there in quadrant one. The upper left is high economic outcome and uh, better public health outcome. And those are the countries, Vietnam, China, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Just the four. In the quadrant marked as two in lower left of the slide is for countries that have low economic but high public health outcomes, including social outcomes. These countries like India with a blue halo, South Africa with pink halo, Argentina red halo, other countries like Germany, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, all these countries had variation ranging from low to high restrictions used for lockdown. Apparently, all countries in quadrant two, including India, chose to protect lives more than the economic uh, outcomes. So that's the worst quadrant to be in. And the world's best economies, including the US, US, Brazil, and Iran, Saudi Arabia, those countries are in quadrant three. That means they had worse economic outcomes as well as worse public health outcomes, including very heavy levels of death. And quadrant four is the upper right, which is the lone EU countries that have had high economic outcome, but worse public health outcomes, such as the high number of infections and deaths. Moderate restrictions in EU is uh, indicated with a pink halo. Thus, quadrant one countries got the best socioeconomic outcomes and quadrant three countries got the worst socioeconomic outcomes. With that introduction, we move on to our first speaker, that is Dr. Swati Maheshwari, Senior Internal Medicine Specialist in Delhi and Gurugram, and a popular TV host on social issues, including COVID-19. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Subhas Hira sir for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to present my thoughts on this wonderful platform and uh, the great initiative that you have taken up uh, during these times. Uh, I know we are still in the middle of the pandemic and uh, still fighting it at such a large scale across the world. But uh, I think what we are seeing right now is just tip of the iceberg because we are more or less right now just more occupied with fighting with the virus and the pandemic that is there. But I think a bigger tsunami is there to hit us once all this settles up because that's what we see when we look at the social impacts uh, of COVID. And I think uh, some way or the other, we need to start preparing for it now uh, because this is an eventuality that will strike us. This is not something that uh, we can or somehow we would wish to, though uh, definitely to not uh, see all this happening around. But then, yes, uh, this is something that's going to strike us very hard, uh, looking at the social impacts and all. Uh, so very good evening to all the listeners and everyone who are there and all, to my co-panelists as well. A very good evening to all of you. And uh, so... I think I'll just start with the presentation. So we all know that uh, COVID is a human, economic, and a social crisis. And, uh, and uh, none of the people from any race, religion, uh, any background, ethnic background, nationality, everybody has been impacted by it. Uh, and we not necessarily have to be infected to actually get, inf uh, to get impacted by it. So everyone uh, across the world has been impacted by this in a very, very large way and more would be impacted in times to come. We have been talking about these SDGs uh, from quite a while now and we all know that these are the global goals uh, which were adopted by the UN member states and we have, uh, it, that was in 2015 and we all know it was a universal call to end poverty and to protect the planet. Uh, and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity in at least by 2030. But we all know that uh, now all these SDTs have uh, got a very uh, kind of a bad blow because uh, out of these 17, 10 of these SDGs are the ones which have been uh, directly impacted by this pandemic. And we know there'll be a collateral damage to the rest of the SDGs that are there. And so uh, 
at present all these sdgs they appear even more ambitious than what they looked uh, when we started with them so obviously now we would have to all gear up to different kind of challenges that we are going to face up uh, in the coming time we look at the uh, so not just the immediate effects that health and income and jobs is going to bring about uh, the pandemic the pandemic has brought in a fear of uh, i would say a lot of uncertainty the fear of unseen and therefore there's an increase in people's anxiety and worry and it is affecting their social relationships so you could see frustration depression helplessness setting in into people and uh, their trust is getting affected as well especially with the government and the employers and their personal security and sense of belonging uh, has been really impacted so if we look at the organization for economic cooperation and development then nearly 12% of the households they live in uh, crowded conditions and this adds to the psychological strain of confinement and social distancing measures so especially if you uh, the if you look at the oecd it has roughly around 37 member states and so it roughly covers a, a quite a large population of the world and we could say that it represents uh, quite uniformly as to what we are trying to say over here so looking at that also i would say the access to the basic and the exclusive sanitation is still a challenge and uh, and is an important for limiting the spread of the virus between households because if you look at this then an exclusive indoor toilet facility for one family is still a far fetched dream for many so when people are living in crowded places and uh, they share the toilets and they share such facilities then the chances of spread of the infection they increase many fold also if we look at the across the 28 oecd countries 36% of the people are financially insecure meaning that they lack financial assets to keep their family above the poverty line for more than 3 months and this is what is more important here should their income suddenly stop so these are people who were not below poverty line they were very well earning and all and everything prior to covid so if you could say then their income was above half of median in their country. Country. but now since their income has suddenly slopped or stopped they are slipping away below the poverty line and for them it has become a huge challenge and these are people generally like a single parent or large families or low wage workers or they could even be less educated or people in precarious jobs so these kind of people are the ones who were living at the edge but now since because of the covid they would be pushed beyond this and they actually are a very very vulnerable population right now also if we could move to the next one then uh, i would say that despite the recent progress in poverty reduction more than 2 billion people are either near or living in multi dimensional poverty and more than 40% of the global population do not have any social protection so if you look at this uh, multi dimensional poverty then so it's not just lack of money these poor people suffer from so there are many other maladies that they have like clean uh, not having clean drinking water not having good living conditions or it could be lack of health malnutrition so these people are already the ones who were just already too prone to all these kind of disasters and all these kind of uh, calamities that come in but now they are more on the edge i would say also i would say that they lack since they lack social protection so they lack uh, social assistance they lack the social insurance and they also lack the labor market protection that should be there so there is lack of uh, cash or kind transfers they would uh, be facing food insecurity then uh, they would also uh, i think require a cover which a uh, designated contingencies like these could be you know covered up for these people also they don't have any employment unemployment benefits and uh, skill upgradation so this is a kind of a population which has been deprived of all these things over the years and now since we are facing this pandemic they are even even more vulnerable to all the kind of ill effects of the pandemic i would say also the effects of such events may be damaging for people in countries which heavily depend on tourism 
uh, such as small island developing states or inflows of remittances or on an official development assistance. So there are certain sectors which have been hit much, much more than the others. And tourism is one of that. And the countries and the people who were thriving, who their whole soul on tourism and all, they have been really hit bad and worst hit, I would say. Then moving on, I would say then uh, there's a large population which is being pushed below poverty lines. So it's just uh, like I just said that uh, they were already an inequal uh, population and now they have this risk of being pushed below the poverty line as well. So pushing about 40 to 60 million people into extreme poverty and the current international poverty line stands at a dollar 1.9 per day. So they are at increased risk and there are 23 out of these 23 million other people they are pushed into poverty are projected to be in the sub-saharan africa and uh, roughly around 16 million in the south asia so the imf projects that in 2020 advanced economies will contract by around six percent while the emerging markets and the developing economies will contract by one percent so casting global poverty um, actually is a very difficult task, I would say, and it requires a lot of assumptions and global data. And these figures are from the World Bank uh, forecast. And after 1998, the Asian financial crisis, this is the first time that the global poverty is going to increase. Now, the number of people living on less than $1.320 and $1.50 uh, per day are also the population that would be affected. And these are the people who would be requiring aggressive, I think, assistance to actually save them. Then I would move on to increased vulnerability of poor urban population. So as the urban population across the world uh, got impacted first and most as well, because um, we know that it was the international flights that brought in the infection to different countries. So they were the ones who were the hit first and the poor urban population had many negative impacts uh, from this uh, pandemic. So over 1 billion people uh, living in informal settlements and the slum like conditions exposed to heightened risk of infection, face job loss, direct impact on food security, shelter, and basic needs. Now, since most of these cluster of infections are in the urban slum dwellers, it led uh, to more prolonged quarantine and cooperation with the uh, screening teams. So not just struggling uh, with day-to-day -day flight of feeding the mouths, uh, they were also expected to patiently cooperate with teams and if found positive, then comply with the quarantine rules as well. So it's like very difficult for these people who are struggling with day to day, uh, finding food for their family and then also, you know, kind of uh, being met uh, by these screening teams who ask them to do something very different from what they've been doing and something which is not a priority in their life for that matter. And also there is an increased risk of migration for these people because this sudden economic shock to them has made it very difficult for them to bear the expenses of lodging and living in urban setup. So I think this also highlights a very important fact over here that uh, the urban vulnerability mapping is something that should be really looked at uh, by the government so that anytime such kind of disaster happens, then things can be moved fast for these people because you know uh, where to hit, what time to hit, what place to hit. So if you have something like these vulnerable mappings for the urban sector, I think it would be really helpful for disasters to come. And uh, we have these migrants uh, which are further displaced. So most of these urban population, um, as I told you, has risk of migrating. And we have seen over these few months of pandemic, we have seen mass migration happening, especially in India as well, and also in the other countries where people have moved back to their native places because they felt very insecure where they were and also they were forced to move back. So if you look at it, uh, then uh, around UN estimates that nearly 30% of the workforce in highly affected sectors in the OECD countries is foreign born. So we already have a 30% of migrant population across the world. Also the negative effects of job loss is significant for both 
internal and international migrant workers as they often work in informal jobs and they lack safety nets in case of job loss or illness. Also, I would say that these migrants are prone to various social, psychological and emotional trauma, uh, especially because they have this fear of neglect by the local community. Also, they have concerns about the well-being and safety of their families waiting in their native places. Also, the families in the native places depend partially or maybe entirely on the money that is sent by the migrant earning member of the family. And the ever mounting rents and debts at uh, the urban setup where they were with no inflow of cash has really brought them to a breaking point, I think. Also, I would say that schools of migrant workers tend to move back to their native places, increasing the risk of transmission for the entire population. So once these migrants, they move from the urban area to the rural area, to the native area, they carry the infection with them and they increase the spread. Secondly, the magnitude of the internal migration is about two and a half times that of the internal migration. So international migration is not much a concern right now. At present, when we are in this middle of the pandemic, the internal migration is something that we really have to be worried about because that is what is taking the infection from one place to another. Then migration from major metro cities has given rise to a shortage of non-technical workers working in the energy industry and also in the manufacturing units. And so now once these people have gone back to their native places, the other problem that arises now is reverse migration, which will be very critical to recovery from the economic effects of COVID-19. So as this would involve cost, it would involve logistics. And uh, more than that, I think more essential would be to instill confidence back into these migrants and reassuring them that they should come back to work and uh, I think it would be a really uphill task uh, trying to actually build back the confidence into these migrants. Then uh, the agriculture and the food uh, would be quite hugely impacted because now due to the pandemic induced income shocks, then uh, disruption to global supply chains, and also the labor shortage uh, that has posed quite uncertainty for this agricultural production. Also, I would say the demand side risks are mostly related with the low income countries because their problem is that they don't have too much demand at present because of the lockdowns and the income shocks that the people have suffered. Also the lower income populations have high propensity to adversely change the dietary intakes in response to income shocks. Because what I feel is that uh, we're barely able to manage one square meal for the entire family. So the quality and the variety gets heavily compromised at present. And so therefore there will be high risk of malnutrition coming up in over the years. Also, I would say the countries in the uh, higher economic brackets, they are more likely to face uh, disruptions stemming from the supply side, giving uh, the high integration in global supply chains and the capital intensive agricultural systems as uh, the capital intensive agricultural systems are more exposed to disruptions, I would say in the credit markets. So definitely that is going to get impacted and the choice of food was going to definitely get impacted. And now coming to, I think children uh, who have been most impacted, I would say during this pandemic, uh, though we have seen that uh, kids have not been directly infected uh, by COVID, thankfully only 1.7% of the population of the world has been infected if we look at children, but there have been many, many other effects on children due to this pandemic. And uh, let's go through these because I think these would be something which would be very, very important for all of us as well. So if you look at school closures, uh, which we all know uh, that closed. So nationwide closure of schools and universities in 192 countries. Now we are seeing some opening up of schools in certain countries, but then again, it's a very cautious approach that everyone is taking then a disrupted education of nearly 1.6 billion learners, or if I would say 90% of the world's student population, which is very huge. And then immediate priority is access to 
online classes or alternative learning which could be television radio but um, though the digital technologies are window to the world i would still say that there is only less than half of half, half of the households in majority of countries which have access to internet so once we are looking at online classes and everything this could not be something that could go on forever or we could not say that this is something which is going to bring in a change in the life of the people or something because half of the world does not have internet access also if you look at data from 60 developing countries then only 73 percent of the urban households have tv whereas if you look at the rural population only 38 percent have tv also according to the international telecommunication union 53 percent of the world's population uses internet and that was in 2019 and also the distribution of internet is not uniform across the globe so if you look at countries like europe then 82 percent would be using internet whereas if you look at africa then only 28 percent would be using internet and if you go to even less developed countries then only 19 percent would be using internet so we can't depend on this kind of education giving forever for that matter and so this leads to a lot of access disparity for students because some of them must be availing these online classes but then definitely there is a large chunk of such kids who are not able to access these online classes then if you look at uh, furthermore in the, into the topic then school closures the presence of a positive and stimulating home environment in is another important factor because now kids are confined to their homes so many kids find them trapped in abusive and neglectful situations during such times also the prolonged absence from school is associated with lower retention and graduation rates and so there would be an increase in dropouts now also the progress towards sdg4 which is quality education will be reversed as a consequence and global aid and spending on education will definitely be negatively affected because as there will be greater pressing sectors i'm sure so the aid would get diverted to the other sectors and education definitely which is a multiplier force but yes it would take a back seat for now i think also you know it took us decades of hard work and sweat i would say to actually build up these dropout rates because if you look at a few decades back then there was a lot of these dropouts also there was a difficulty in gender equality when it came to education because most of the girls were dropping out and though boys still continued then taking three of them through to graduation or vocational skills we have really pulled in a lot of blood and sweat behind this to reach the point that we are today but yes we are slipping now because of this covid also, if you look at, it's not just the schools. There are a lot of other factors which are affecting children today. First of all, I would say is missing out on life-saving vaccinations and disrupted general medical care. They risk losing their lives to pneumonia. And uh, just to tell you, pneumonia, every year we lose roughly around 8 lakh kids less than 5 years of age. So roughly around 2,000 kids a day. And now we can see as to how the pneumonia HIV, diarrheal diseases, malaria, all this will go up because their vaccination is impacted, their other routine health services are impacted, their caregiving is affected. So in fact, uh, it says that uh, due to HIV service disruption, around 6,73,000 more deaths will happen by end of the next year. And this we are talking about HIV alone. So just look at the kind of impact that COVID is having, not directly impacting the kids, but the kids who are suffering from other diseases would definitely, we'll see more mortality in that sense. Also, if we would say then the IMR would go up, that is the infant mortality rate is expected to go up now. We have really worked hard to bring it to the level that it is today, but it would definitely even slip uh, slide up back i think as many as three billion people lack hand washing facilities with soap and water 
Also 1.6 billion have facilities lacking soap or water and 1.4 billion have no facilities at all. And we realize that uh, hand washing is a very fundamental mechanism that protects you from COVID. But yet we have so many children who are not, don't even have access to hand washing facilities. And we really need to look at this as to how we are going to protect these kids uh, from the infection. And so even UNAIDS has urged people not to die divert their investments towards other side and continue with the kind of investments that they had given to such kind of health programs for kids. So that should continue and not uh, that people should start diverting their money to the other side. But they really urged that people should continue because this is a sector which is very, very essential and crucial because this is related to future generations. Also then, um, Around many children are deprived of the nutritious meals that they were getting at the school and the care program. So now since they're not going to the school, they have been deprived of this nutritious meals. And to tell you, there are 360 million kids who have been deprived of these school meals right now. So, and half of these are from the low and the lower middle economy uh, sector. So these kids, which actually used to bank on the food that they used to get into the school are uh, not being provided these meals. So most of them, uh, I think it, it is like the lifeline has been cut for them because this is what they actually depended on. Now, next, uh, I would say there's also increased risk of violence and broader child right crisis, uh, which including mistreatment, gender-based violence, exploitation, then social exclusion, all that is also going to happen. And most of the child and the family welfare services at present are overstretched or they have got disrupted completely because of the lockdowns. So the children have become really vulnerable at present. Children have been abruptly cut off from positive and supportive relationships that they rely on, uh, which act during the time of distress, which could be their caregivers, it could be at school, their teachers over there, or in the extended family and in the community. So at present, they are really confined to the house and to the members in the house. So they don't have access to the people who could have been their stress busters or who, who, who were the ones who actually they confided into uh, during the times of distress. So eight in 10 children from one to 14 years were subjected to some form of psychological aggression or physical punishment at home by caregivers in the past month. So just look at the data, just two kids have got saved and look at it, eight out of 10 have suffered some form of aggression or punishment in the last month. So, and it's not that we are seeing this for the first time. If we really look at public health emergencies that have happened in the past, uh, we have seen these effects happening then also. So this is something which was, uh, which is bound to happen. But what we need to see is that since we have seen it in the last public health emergencies, we need to have a more rigorous system and a management to see that such kind of things do not happen in future. And every time a disaster happens, these things are bound to be there. So we need to find ways to maneuver through this. So just continuing with the children that bear the brunt, I would say that if you look at the Indian helpline, they received roughly around 92,000 emergency calls for protection from abuse and violence in just 11 days of lockdown. And uh, so there are three quarters of children who are aged two to four worldwide who are subject to worldwide aggression and uh, corporal punishment by caregivers at the home, which I just mentioned, and I'm just repeating the same point. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, if you come to the women and the girls as well, then 18% of the ever partnered women and girls aged 15 to 49 have experienced physical or sexual partner violence in past few months. So there'll be increase in teenage pregnancies now, there'll be increased in human trafficking for that matter. Also, uh, just going by the recent Ebola pandemic that happened, if you look at the data, uh, which was um, during the Ebola uh, outbreak. Then in Sierra Leone, a teenage pregnancy doubled to more than 14,000 just before the outbreak. So if you can look at it, all these different kinds of outbreaks and pandemics when they happen, 
this is what is bound to happen. This is something that we have learned from the last pandemics. So this is something that we really need to work on because we have been seeing this from one pandemic to another. So we really need to understand that these are very important aspects of a society. Then out of the uh, world's 13 million child refugees, uh, those who reside in camps, they face similar challenges. And if, just to tell you that half of the world refugee population are children for that matter. So you, we can imagine what kind of impact it is having on their lives. Also a million child asylum seekers and 17 million displaced children are among those who are most likely to be excluded from the social protection. So I would just like to add even the drug trafficking would increase even I would say uh, the organized crime and the youth gangs that are there I think will sprung up more after this because the kind of poverty and the other misery that this pandemic has brought the crime rate definitely will go up as well coming to the next one that is the gender equality gap which is further widened as well so the increased bulk of unpaid and domestic care work is done by women and on an average they do three times as much as men so definitely with this lockdown and no help available and you're confined to your houses and no outside food as well and nothing as well and even the education part being taken care of by mothers at home i think definitely they are burdened much much more than uh, the male counterparts for that matter so they the burden has really increased on them and this would have impacts in form of mental health, um, what I feel that would be much, much more important. And we really need to look at that as well as to how their uh, mental uh, well-being is at present with all these kind of different loads that is there on them. Then uh, widespread job losses is also very, very essential because this will have long term impacts for women's economic independence and security. So there are roughly around 740 million women globally in informal employment. And these are the female who are very, very vulnerable right now. And many of them have already lost their jobs. And for them, it become very difficult, and especially if they are a single parent or if uh, they're wages was something which the family heavily depended on then it becomes a huge problem for these families as well then the women healthcare workers are at the forefront we know that uh, they are the corona warriors and 70 percent of the global healthcare workforce at present is women and so they are definitely at a high risk of infection as well and so if you look at the gender equality gap, then uh, I think domestic violence is another thing which is very, very important and uh, needs to be highlighted here because these mandatory confinements have uh, posed a great problem for these women. And uh, so there's an increased calls all across uh, where people have reported more and more of domestic violence. So I would say the violence against women and girls has intensified and 60% increase in the emergency calls across globally, I would say. And then uh, also, if you look at the UNFPA, then estimated that 31 million more domestic violence cases, if the lockdown continues for six more months, then so we can see as to how much of this problem is there already. And this these emergency calls are coming when we know that women generally suffer, they would rather suffer than speak up. So you can imagine as the kind of calls and the number of calls that are coming in. So also there's an interrupted access to the sexual and the reproductive health services. So there are a lot of pregnant females and uh, females who are having other kind of problems who are not able to access them because at present the hospitals are giving priority to COVID patients so their services have got hampered as well so then the other section which has been really uh, affected is the older and the disabled who are finding it very difficult in these times because these are the ones who actually dependent were dependent on the others for a lot of their activities and suddenly now because of the confinement they are finding it very difficult to do their daily routine follow their uh, the different things that they used to do during the day so high risk of infection and death that we all know that uh, corona has really been i would say very unfair to the old people for that matter and uh, they are the ones who have, uh, we have seen the 95% of the mortality we have seen is in the older age group only. And so one 
they are at a greater risk and uh, they are more prone to more severe disease as well. Secondly, they can experience age-based discrimination in the provision of healthcare services. And that's what we saw at Italy, Spain, and most of the countries which were grappling with a lot of uh, patient load. For them, it became very difficult to decide to uh, give the ventilator to an old patient or to give ventilator to a young patient. And I think some way or the other, a lot of discrimination at that point of time happened, uh, especially if you look at countries like European countries for that matter. Then there was increased social isolation and it worsens their uh, well-being and health outcomes because we, a lot of, uh, we heard a lot of stories where pe the old people were chucked out of the house or they were not given entry or they were not looked after because people thought that they are the ones who are getting infected and they would infect the other uh, members of the family. So they really uh, went through tough times for that matter. And also the social stigmatization and the denial of support at a time, uh, at a time, sorry, when uh, they may be at most need of care and support. And uh, those who are highly care dependent may become more anxious, angry and withdrawn during the outbreak or while in isolation, especially we have seen with uh, people who have been in the old age homes and all and everything, it became very difficult for them because the support staff got start, uh, started getting infected and they had to be pulled out of the healthcare homes. And then cleaning homes and washing hands frequently can be challenging due to physical impairments or interrupted services for these kind of people. Then uh, I would come on to the refugees and the displaced population, which again is a huge uh, chunk of our population for that matter. Over 70 million persons uh, are forcibly displaced as a result of war, conflict or persecution. And if you look at the data, then because of the lockdown, then on 10th March, the, when most of the lockdowns were happening across the world, International Organization for Migration recorded 500 5,430 restrictions imposed by 105 countries and by 23rd March it rose up to 33,000. So thereby limiting the freedom of movement at the as the borders closed. So these people were not able to move uh, from one country to another and they were stuck where they were. Also 73 countries have restricted access to national asylum procedures and 58 countries having restricted uh, access uh, to national registration also. Therefore, there is under-representation of the figures if you look at uh, for those who were the asylum seekers, because as it is, the countries were not registering and they did not have their portals open during that time. So if you look at UNHCR, then there was a decrease by 80% in the asylum seekers, but as I said, it is deceptive because people were not able to approach these portals for that matter. So, and again, I would write, reiterate over here that 80% of the refugee population is children. So keep, I keep on reminding everyone on that. So, because these are the people, uh, children I feel are the worst brunt bearers of this entire pandemic. Since we brought in these emergency and disaster management acts, and this has happened in all the countries, so a lot of people's human rights have also been threatened, though uh, international human rights uh, treaties have been working, but a lot of these uh, yet to be implemented kind of laws are there. So there's a huge uh, population which is vulnerable, especially with disabilities, LGBTI, refugees, displaced population, and all these people. And so for them also, you know, we are not just testing uh, our capacity to fight with the pandemic. What I feel is we are also testing a society's resilience and how it behaves with its uh, members and how it behaves with its citizens is something that we really need to look at right now as well. So just the last point that uh, though we see all those heartwarming pictures from across the world saying that the nature is healing itself and the wildlife is healing itself and uh, we are locked up but they all are now enjoying uh, around but I still feel um, it is, it's going to stay only for a while. So as soon as these we humans are going to come out of our house, they will be pushed back to the wall again. And not just uh, that the pollution has settled for a while, but we have another kind of pollution coming up as well. And that is in the form of the medical waste that is coming up from across the world in terms of the PPEs and the different kind of gloves and masks and all these things that have 
that are being used at such a wide scale right now. So uh, what are we thinking about disposal of these waste? It's something that we really, really need to look at right now. So I think I would like to end there, just try to uh, summarize some of the social impacts which I see affecting most the different segments of the society which I see. So now it's for the governments actually to have very kind of inclusive programs and very rapid uh, kind of programs where you include the government, you include the private players, you include the NGOs, and you also include the people so as to we can get back to our life, we could uh, all these social impacts that are there could uh, we could actually bring down these parameters and they would not escalate to the levels that we are seeing here or the forecast that is there. So if you could work faster, I think we could we would be able to achieve the uh, goals that we had said in the SDGs. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Swati. It's been an excellent presentation, very wide area of social impact. Uh, certainly what uh, caught my attention was that eight out of 10 children uh, are facing uh, some form of uh, violence at home as a result of these lockdowns or millions of young women and uh, girls going through sexual violence. I'll leave this to the question answer session at a later point, but uh, we'll move on quickly to the second speaker who's going to cover the, the social impact of uh, COVID in rural settings. And uh, that is Mr. Alish Kumar. He is co-lead with Transform Rural India Foundation, a large foundation which is an initiative of Tata Trust and have been largely uh, engaged in the rural area. So it's Mr. Anish Kumar, uh, it's your time, please. Thank you, Dr. Ira. And it's tough act to follow Dr. Swati. She covered a whole range of, uh, you know, demography and whole range of impact in a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Now, one thing that has struck me is uh, we are in midst of uh, varying degrees of uh, pessimism. And it would require some degree of uh, effort on our part to be optimistic about uh, what the future holds for us. I was uh, looking at uh, the defining, and if you were to say, you know, migrants in India, and my focus would be on uh, rural India. So the defining uh, and uh, in some ways tragic, sad, poignant, uh, you know, image of this uh, pandemic they have started back home. Some horrifically could not make it uh, to their home. The image from railway platform from my hometown, Muzaffarpur, is the defining and dehumanizing unjust face of the pandemic, uh, as we know. The visible face of uh, the migrant crisis, as you know, was invisible. It was uh, like an underbelly. No one uh, knew about it uh, as if, and uh, we didn't have any numbers. Amazingly, we didn't have any numbers on the migrants. I was asking, uh, what did uh, these unfortunate uh, citizens, uh, fellow citizens uh, escape from? And that's is an important question, not because it will tell us of uh, their aspirations and dreams and also the deeply unequal uh, society that we inhabit, but also to what socioeconomic setting they are returning to. Rural is what concerns us at Transform Rural India, and uh, we are focused on uh, creating equal opportunities, as we say, for uh, someone born in rural India. Let me give you some numbers uh, for us to gather a sense of the rural India's economic setting. And in some ways, economic is important because uh, now we have the goalposts for us have shifted from fighting uh, Corona to living with uh, Corona. From Jan hai to Jahan hai, we have completely turned around to say Jan hai, Jahan hai to hi Jan hai. So in some ways, uh, it is important to look at the economic setting. So some numbers I will you know, place and then uh, I will discuss what it uh, means for the uh, people. The dominant income source in rural India is uh, manual casual labor. 
with 50% of the households uh, dependent on it. Cultivation as an income source, only 30% have reported in the socioeconomic caste census as uh, important. Agriculture, if we take that as an important uh, economic activity, 60% is almost 60% is uh, rain fed. That is uncertain, risky, with gross outputs in the range of about 60,000 odd uh, per hectare and 91% uh, marginal land holding. And in some states, actually, like uh, Bihar, you would have uh, 0.75 hectare as uh, mean. You can do the maths to know what kind of agriculture income we'll have. If given a choice, so no wonder, you know, there was a, in 2018, CSDS had done a study and there they found about 61% of the farm families uh, reported they would prefer to be employed in uh, cities. 76% of the farmers would prefer to do something other than uh, farming. The rural SME employment in the last two decades has steadily declined, while at the same time, the gross output of the manufacturing sector from rural areas actually is more than urban today. Now, when I, you know, we keep hearing in the last uh, few days uh, more so, and I have been part of a few webinars where NIGS has been talked about. Let's look at the numbers there. 10 crore job card holders, they have barely got 37 days of uh, guaranteed work from the 100 days uh, promised to them. And that has covered roughly 5.5 uh, crore, that's about 55 million households. This is the economic distress that we had the migrants uh, exuding from largely as a casual, informal wage workers in our cities. I mean, in the sense that The other impulse has been, just look at the median age in rural areas. Today it is uh, less than 27. And with about 20, 87 odd percent having some kind of a schooling. They are children of the information, entertainment and communication age. Where middle class lives are beamed. Now with geo, it is beamed right in your palm and affordable handset, through an affordable handset. The camera of uh, jobs, urban life, amenity is a second pull for the young and upwardly mobile rural youth. On the social side, uh, Dr. Swati has talked at length. I will speak of other dimension, the violence due to caste transgressions in accessing social and public spaces. Lynching, we have uh, heard in the last uh, two years, both of Muslims and Dalits, gender violence, and it's no one's argument that you don't have uh, caste discrimination in urban India, but the extent of violence, the subtle and not so subtle undermining of one's identity and self-worth is another reason for escape. Rural India, in, in recent times, uh, we talk of uh, it in, in ways which uh, the narrative was built in our formative years as an independent country, both in pre post uh, India, we had seen our three tall leaders, Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, having a different uh, you know, outlook to village. While Gandhi looked at it as uh, area, villages as uh, sites of growth, authenticity. Now, for Nehru, villages were uh, dung heaps, uh, were uh, images of uh, backwardness. And for Ambedkar, the village was site of oppression. These three impulses actually define the rural as we know today. We are a large country. And given the size, what is uh, true, all these are true actually. And all these would not also be true. For example, the tribal villages where I have spent most of my life, uh, the forest dwellers keeping the human ecology balance intact. There is a way for community living, uh, you know, they have uh, been demonstrating for long. And I'd like to highlight today's villages are very different. The way the individual community state uh, Balance has been, uh, you know, getting uh, redefined. There is a opportunity for us to look at uh, the present situation in a different way from two institutional uh, formations. And I look at it, and I'll speak about it a little later also, why it becomes uh, very important. At one, the community end, you have uh, community-based organizations like women collectives, farmer collectives, and the other is the constitutional structure of uh, gram panchayats. Both have been the first port of call, the first response, and have been at the forefront of building a community-based uh, resilience uh, in times of COVID. 
post covid what is the situation in rural india not very different from what dr swati described we have we have now and you know, today i was reading as we speak uh, the health secretary of jharkhand said from the first lockdown when they had zero cases to date has reached all its districts bihar karnataka everyone has been reporting increasing numbers of migrants uh, who have uh, brought infection to rural india maybe our saving grace will be low population density but that also is not true for the entirety of uh, rural landscape the dalit tolas mohallas or say in for example in uh, bundelkhand where you have six seven families staying under the same roof just like uh, mumbai is trolls without any infrastructure of frequent uh, hand washing we did a adequacy map of 20 odd rural districts where we are present as a part of the transformation of aspirational district program so not to our surprise actually the corona warriors the medical professions didn't had or knew how to use ventilators or ppe we are looking at a very tough situation icmr has just started i think in 78 79 districts some serological uh, sampling they are doing to assess the extent of spread we will know how the poor testing treatment and tracing infrastructure in rural india is uh, has upended the situation there the infrastructure for quarantine and isolation largely managed left to be managed by the gram panchayats uh, we know without uh, you know running water the kind of you know years and years of neglect of public health uh, is a challenge it can't be you know yeah in few uh, you know doses of lockdowns cannot be addressed the other thing is the weight has crowded out everything covid it has rural india has had burden of diseases we know the gaps on vaccinations bcg immunization nutrition services the treatment of ncds who survey has just come which has captured the serious disruption in the prevention and treatment on food we did a very large survey uh, which was uh, anchored by sambhavi and vikas and vaish across 50 districts so 50% of the households have reduced number of meals as a coping strategy 68% have reduced food on their plate and this when 84% of them had access to the public distribution system so we are looking at a serious challenge and as i described earlier rain fed means your food you know production happens in rain months my friends you know, we talked about just imagine census 2011 it's not that we didn't know and reported estimates of 453 million internal migrants and that's 40% of our total population we still don't have data on that and we need to discover it with the pictures beam to us the, the estimates are 140 million and you know migrant uh, workers now i don't know there are various other estimates floating because there are just no any you know numbers without numbers you can but to give a context and i will pick up government numbers government of bihar is talking about 3 million migrants 30 lakh migrants uh, coming back and then when they have a rural households are about 180 million 1.8 crores just imagine when they come back what will happen the same brother you know who was taking out the living by driving or doing something in the city is comes back and now wants to take a living out of the same piece of land the kind of tensions the other day i heard in lahaba two brothers came to blows so we're looking at increased social tensions if for nothing at least the remittance has completely stopped that impacts close to 55% of the rural households when they come back do we have work for them actually in one webinar i did say that uh, if they have been working to factories all along can factories not work to them as a rhetoric uh, that's okay the last 70 years we have been trying that we have been successful mgn rgs we talked about you know barely 8% 8% barely had 100 days of and 5.5 crore households as i said agriculture there is a estimate by technoserve which is looking at in the next uh, couple of years a decline of 4.5 4.4 trillion rupee and they are looking at in the more remunerative segments of the agri economy plantation spices fruits that is a segment they are looking at because of drop in value of crops uh, and roughly impacting close to about uh, 1.1 was 17 million that's about 2 uh, crore farming households what implication all this has in the last 10 years and dr swati did mention that we had an unprecedented in indian context 271 million 
people, and that's the UN multidimensional poverty report, uh, raised above poverty line. And you, this was also corroborated with close to about 35 million people and you know, moving out of agriculture. With the ascent and descent of plus 10% with some health shock and you know, would happen. But at this scale, the end mass and you know, the, the drop, precipitous fall of uh, poor and it will devastate the economy. Inequality, in some ways, you know, is intergenerational. Just imagine the schools on the other side of digital divide or the balcony divide, as we know now. Children and mothers missing their nutrition, missing the vaccinations. We may be today, in times of COVID, seeing inequality at an unprecedented scale, lifetime inequality at an unprecedented scale. The returning migrant is a pool of entrepreneurial talent. A section of it is a pool of entrepreneurial talent. This is a risk taker. You're not been you're living in margins in the cities, not dependent on handouts. Can we dip into this uh, talent to build something different from the rural economy? Communities, even though the political economy may not be supportive of it, but the fiscal you know, challenge that we have, we will like everyone to be at Nirvan. On the Gram Panchayat CBOs, I see a new narrative emerging, and more so because they have shown at the forefront what they can bring. Visibility of migrants. I don't think we can go back to again invisibilizing them the way they have been invisibilized for the last uh, three decades or so. Agriculture again, while you know the structural constraints we did talk about, some opening that uh, the Atmanirbhar Bharat package could. Then you know we need a new deal. And I was reading an estimate somewhere that if the entire agriculture output in India was to be organized from a production system as it is in US, where you have an average land holding of 117, 118 hectare. I mean, that, that would only need, you know, just imagine 40 lakhs, 40 lakhs, 4 million farmers would suffice for the entire output that India now produces. Well, that would be unsustainable ecologically and otherwise. And merely focusing on farms may not be a great idea, but it does tell that with the various uh, things that this government is talking about, the 100,000 uh, crore agri infrastructure fund, near farm storage, processing, all this could bring, maybe they have seeds of bringing that uh, new deal for the farm sector, new kind of partnerships. Uh, we could see the markets, the farm markets, um, clutches of Mondays opening out. We could, we don't know how it will pan out. The rules are not out. The investment and, you know, plan is not laid out. But they could, uh, as the economic survey this year uh, pointed out, uh, large scale shift from subsistence farming to more productive commercial farming, it could open up. The other segment of value addition and, you know, in the rural economy could be around green jobs, the non-timber forest produce. Again, that is a segment we have neglected for long. This is, you know, again, the gamut of uh, measures, including, you know, yesterday that cabinet took around MSMEs. These open new opportunities to look at rural economy afresh, whatever has not happened in the last seven decades. Maybe this is the time with the entrepreneurial talent and the range of things uh, could happen in a way in which we could look up uh, to the rural economy. Thank you for a good presentation, uh, uh, Mr. Anish Kumar. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you have uh, broadened your discussion quite a bit, uh, I think went a little beyond the COVID thing, but uh, certainly we have not heard much about uh, lynching or any of these related to COVID as yet. So I think just to be sure that uh, there is so much of social upheaval as Dr. Swati Maheshwari also defined that what is happening in the urban areas is also happening. Uh, due to the disease and uh, sudden changes uh, in terms of families and uh, employment. So yes, I think we have to address that uh, with uh, counseling and uh, some form of social support system. So thank you so much. I think we'll have a question time and enough time to discuss this further. Our third speaker is uh, Dr. Srinivas uh, Shroff. He is CEO of uh, a REC Foundation. So this REC is Rural Electrification Corporation uh, Foundation of India. It's a, 
parastatal government company uh, and the foundation is set up by that company. He is a development specialist and uh, uh, experienced with skilling for employment. So your focus, uh, Dr. Srinivas, is on skilling with the COVID laid a uh, lot of uh, social upheavals that have happened, not only in Asia and Africa, but the entire world that I just uh, uh, gave an overview of in, 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 in that uh, uh, sketch, uh, showing the uh, economic and public health uh, outcomes were uh, changed. So it's over to you. Thank you, Dr. Subhash Hira. Uh, thank you, Santosh Ji, for introducing me to this uh, platform. And uh, thank you, uh, Sambodhi, for organizing this. Uh, let me first, uh, you know, uh, give you an out overview of uh, what REC has been, has been doing in CSR. Uh, REC Limited is a non-banking finance corporation. It uh, lends to the power sector. And uh, as per the government uh, uh, CSR Act, 2% of the net profit has to be spent on CSR. So we have a, they have established the REC Foundation, uh, which is the implementing arm of, uh, a CSR implementing arm of REC Limited. So if we look at uh, last five to six years, when it has been made uh, mandatory, we have uh, contributed to uh, building toilets primarily in the schools. Uh, this has reduced open defecation. And then we funded hundreds of solar rooftops primarily to support environmental sustainability, but it also helped in market uptake. Uh, then uh, we have been supporting aspirational districts, uh, particularly in health, nutrition, and school education. Seven districts have been kind of picked up by us. These are all really remote uh, districts. Uh, as far as uh, Kifre in Nagaland, which is uh, uh, geographically the remote most, as well as uh, you know, in terms of the uh, Delta Index. And then another bucket of uh, uh, you know funding that we have done is in the disability. A lot of aid, aid and uh, appliances, electrical kinds of etc. And skilling and reskilling is another area that we have uh, been funding. You would see in the table the amount of uh, you know the sanctions and the expenditure that we have made. And yet another is the uh, you know the COVID support. So let me just come to you know the COVID pandemic and something about the migrant worker. I think my previous speaker spoke about it at length, uh, but still to give a backdrop to uh, particularly the skilling, uh, let me just uh, narrate it. Lockdown one, two, three, we did not have uh, much of uh, issue. Migrant workers managed to stay put. And uh, then uh, one of the major issue was the ration and uh, meals. I think that was uh, government uh, was able to provide, but then, Whatever I have gathered, it's not based, and also based on whatever I have read. But the rent, monthly bills on electricity, water, medicine, school fees, and more than all this, it's uncertainty, which made them start going back to their homes. That is during the lockdown four. Uh, when this actually started off, uh, people started going by food, cycles, tricycles, auto rickshaw. Then uh, government uh, machinery put into act, got into action. Uh, stemic special trains were uh, uh, run, government organized buses were run. And let me come to, you know, what kind of migra migration is happening. We, uh, Anish also told us just a while ago, we have almost 140 million migrant workers in India. And these primarily come from four states, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, and Madhya. Where do they go? They go to Mumbai, Delhi, which are the major destinations. Where do they work? They work mostly in manufacturing and construction. And most often they are pretty vulnerable. They don't have inadequate health care, nutrition, housing, and sanitation. That's what we are seeing now. They are the first ones to kind of, you know, return back to their uh, hometown. They unfortunately don't get PDS also. So whatever was supplied to them through the government machinery that they were receiving, but in other words, routine PDS because the ration card is elsewhere in their hometown and the same thing is not running here. The government actually tried to address over the, you know, especially the lockdown four period. Uh, that's one good thing that has started. One nation, one ration card that they, they did start. So 
so uh, that's what i'm uh, coming to this uh, slide uh, really narrates what was the government response they also increased the allocation to narega and they increased the daily wage and uh, there is now uh, almost 10 million migrant workers have reached back to the district headquarters is the kind of number as of uh, 30th may this is increasing and uh, something like 3 million to up two and a half million to bihar and if you see i was trying to read up and try to accumulate what is happening and then particularly coming to skilling also so quarantines are being done at district headquarters there are lots of questions on it how good they are everything is there my previous speaker spoke about it before they reach their villages that's what they are planning to do government is trying to you know from up i, I was gathering what is being planned what is being done they are planning to give affordable houses shops pay for their gsts provide electricity water and other amenities one they have started is a government portal apparently about 1.5 million people have registered according to that 150000 people are were working in real estate 30000 in uh, uh, furniture technicians home decorators drivers electricians home appliances etc so government is also trying to do migrant commission uh, and trying to help the laborers engage they are trying to engage the industry association into it and some districts especially in up uh, one district one product branding marketing is also being thought out all these are in in process now where does the money come from i we were i was reading up 1% cess is collected on the uh, construction whichever is higher than 10 lakh rupees uh, construction they collect 1% so typically it has already accumulated about 52000 crores and 75% uh, of that remains unused but not necessarily where there is money, there are migrant workers. So if you see UP and Bihar are the large migrant population, my guess is I don't have those, uh, you know, state-wise details, but my guess is the cess collected there may be lower. But in all, there is some money available uh, to make a rehabilitation to these displaced workers. So I was trying to list down what are the uh, needs that, what should be done? For this uh, uh, displaced labor one is uh, you know counsel them because there's a lot of fear amongst them when i have also spoken to quite a few there is so much of fear and uh, they are not like they are not coming out to work uh, even uh, you know uh, the uh, drivers they are all fearful completely fearful and second thing i, I was uh, trying to see is we should create you now awareness on opportunities what are the plans of action on rehabilitation? What I covered in the last slide, what are those? They, we have to make them know. The third point I want to make is there is already this mapping of skills available with the displaced laborers, but we also have to the government uh, and those who are say CSR, whoever are the ones in the development sector also have to map the opportunity. Then the next one is the actually reskill uh, them to tune because in the large cities like mumbai and uh, delhi there would be part in construction you know in uh, either unskilled semi-skilled skilled labors in large uh, say apartment complexes or large uh, shopping malls construction etc but when they are back there if they want to find jobs there the local construction infrastructure is something slightly different so the reskilling has to be also uh, has to be in a, it has to be a little different so that has to be some, somehow worked out. We also have to see uh, what kind of opportunities uh, exist in the, you know, the, the towns, the rural setup. Agriculture, value-added agriculture, food products are some of the areas that one can look into. Train on, uh, you know, production and also on um, various aspects related to, uh, you know, the value-adding of the product. Then. Another area is, you know, not only just them as, um, uh, you know, the existing uh, set of things, but also treat them as migrant startups. Uh, the way we have been trying to, you know, startups generally would be, we, we go into the software sector. But, uh, you know, we, we really, because these migrants who have come back, uh, at least, uh, quite a few of them are with some skills. 
technician, electrician, you have seen, uh, you know, uh, we have seen this uh, uh, furniture, etc. And government of India has started uh, government e-marketplace. And uh, I must tell you that uh, they started from scratch about five, six years ago. Now they are uh, doing a business of about the uh, total business is about 25,000 crores. So can they be the input providers? Because a large number of people have been input providers to this government e-marketplace. Say somebody makes bags, somebody makes some, uh, you know, furniture, and can it be sold in government e-market? Uh, because a lot of uh, governmental setup, municipalities, and people like uh, us, public sector leaders, we have to buy from the government e-market. Even the governmental setup, district commissioners, first job is uh, government e-market. So can we link this migrant people, migrant uh, uh, startups with the e-market? Uh, and then um, there, uh, there is this common service centers. There are more than 300,000 of them. That literally means if you, there may be a lot more in cities, a lot more in uh, towns, but uh, if you look at India, we have about 580,000 villages and 300,000 would mean every second village should be having this, uh, you know, common service center. They not only provide services, but also train people. This should be much more used. I mean, migrant is one part, but even otherwise, they should be much more used. Uh, NSDC, National Skill Development Council, has been uh, the no nodal agency, which has developed a lot of vocational uh, syllabus. Now they have to, you know, somehow they have to be engaged. I'm sure they would be engaged, they would be engaged in uh, looking at the skill maps the requirement map and uh, develop some kind of quickly with quick vocations and and uh, skill through their accredited agency now coming to what uh, we have been rec has been doing in the in this area and uh, what can we do in the say year to come let's say uh, in the last uh, five to six years we have spent about 10 million dollars trained about killed about uh, 30 thousand people and more than 70%, you know, if I'm right, more than 80% are wage or self-employed. At least about uh, five to 8,000 people, I do not have the correct number, but I'm very sure it is around that. Women women are skilled and they are either wage employed or self-employed. Uh, second area is, uh, you know, uh, when uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, post article 370 abrogation, we were one of the first to commit uh, support uh to almost more than three thousand people and as of now the about 17 different locations across them Jammu and kashmir and ladakh have been identified and locations identified uh, skilling should have started but the lockdown is pulling us back but hopefully we will move on with it uh and then uh, we took up this uh, very interesting uh, mobile school uh, concept especially in in delhi itself there are seven we identified through an NGO, we identified seven uh, centers where migra uh, uh, migrants are there for several years because you know these constructions happen, and beside that, there is an, one more construction will start, and each construction goes to four to six, seven, eight years. So what happens is their children are just not you know, they, can, they, they they are not taken into the regular schools uh, because of uh, various reasons. So what we are supporting is they can be trained on NIO uh, National Institute of Open Schooling. And where do they sit and read? Uh, even if we want to give money, their uh, uh, informal housing or that area, you cannot construct. So, you know, it's so hard, hot, uh, especially in the summer months, you can't expect them to make them sit in under a tree and uh, educate. So we provided this bus mobile school uh, we, which has been interiors have been converted to uh, a classroom and we have provided some fans. We have provided, uh, you know, the solar roofing to the bus is yet to have the solar roofing, but uh, it will have solar roofing to power that whatever little things are required with the smart class, etc. So it started working. Uh, and then uh, killing varieties of things, whatever are required in that particular region have been uh, supported. Going forward, you know, what can we do especially? We can focus this year for migrant workers, uh, support a few districts in UP and Bihar, which are the worst fit, uh, and then identify and support about, say, 10,000 people, uh, train them on 
not only on their uh, skills, but what is equally important these days is they should know about banking, they should know about language, they should know about government schemes, how to avail them, and uh, how to use the digital platform. And uh, uh, we would like to dedicate about 25% of our whatever leftover CSR funds. We have so we have uh, provided a lot of funds for the COVID uh, uh, response, uh, and then carefully map uh, the skills required. You know, but particularly if you have to uh, support the migrant uh, return mig uh, migrant workers, and then uh, we would also like to continue to support this uh, uh, migrant children on educating them. So this is what you know. In the nutshell, I wanted to say about uh, killing, reskilling, little bit about RSC, what we would like to do, and what really should be done. This is what in a nutshell. I hope uh, I have uh, been on time. Uh, thank you so much for giving this opportunity uh, once again uh, on behalf of RSC Foundation as well as RSC Limited. Excellent presentation, Dr. Srinivas Shroff and your presentation was pretty focused on skilling and the needs for reskilling of uh, individuals and uh, migrants who have moved back as a result of uh, COVID-19. It is a repeat of the same experience that happened 100 years ago due to the Spanish flu in 1920s. We have this COVID which is now bringing new normals and in that new normals, there are four concepts that I think I have heard uh, global development agencies talk about. And they are basically saying that uh, it is going to be uh, self-reliance along the way in all the countries. Every country will have to create uh, skilling and people go for uh, self-employment and the one who does it quickly is the is the mantra the the survival of the quickest will be the the survival there and the, the new normal is going to be teaching every profession every individual every social sector something different including the industrial sector so there are there are several questions thank you so much uh, 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 to all the speakers uh, for putting all on the table so I will start off. There is Dr. Archana Bhattacharji from Assam. She has asked uh, a question for Dr. Swati and other, other panelists, please, if you want to chip in in the answer, you're welcome. Uh, talking about uh, Assam Bee Gardens, saying that the domestic violence has always been there, but it has increased now in this COVID era that is like in the past four months uh, and uh, saying that she's really worried about it. Is there something that uh, you would like to suggest, uh, Dr. Swati? Absolutely. I think what we require now more is, I think, comprehensive, integrated, responsive uh, centers in the community-based setting. I think that is what we actually require. So we really need to counsel uh, these women who are undergoing all this domestic violence so that they can speak up as well. Because the biggest issue I see with the domestic violence is that the most of the women are not ready to speak up because they find it very difficult because at the end of the day, eventually they have to live with the husband. And so, you know, they find it very difficult to go and speak about him and then go back and live with the same person in the, at the family level. So it becomes very difficult. So some way or the other, a lot of counseling is required for uh, even the males and the females, both of them. And if it is to a certain, it is to an extreme level, then definitely they require legal support and advocacy for that matter, because we do have uh, domestic violence acts and everything in place as well. So if the things have gone to extreme, then I think that would be required. But somewhere or the other, you need to deal uh, with their self-esteem as well, because what happens with domestic violence more is that the self-esteem of a female is really hit and the shame and the guilt that this whole thing, uh, the whole issue 
is uh, surrounded with becomes a huge issue for these females as well because generally they don't speak up and they are suffering uh, by themselves and then uh, they have this uh, they don't want to speak up with their relatives also or even with the people that they feel are close to them because they have this shame and guilt uh, uh, with the whole episode and everything so i think they require quite comprehensive counseling for that matter so that they can understand the whole situation and the perspective and that they don't need to suffer forever because there are ways where the even the males can be counseled and then at the extreme end as i said the legal way is always there so i think somewhere or the other you have to build up that safety net for these females so that uh, they know that they have somebody to confide in somebody who can guide them somebody who can even talk to their husbands at times when uh, the things go really bad who can talk to them uh, convince them make them understand how important this is uh, for their wife and how important it is for the well being of their family so i think some way or the other we need to have those support groups who can go and talk and create a safety net for these females i feel some way or the other i think uh, that is what is more required because one thing is that they lack information as well most of the females they don't have access to information that in such kind of situation what could what could they access how they could come out of it do they even have a legal support system for this or not so most of the uh, females would be oblivious to the entire situation for that matter so just i think bringing that information to their table is also very essential for them to feel empowered for them to feel uh, confident for them to tackle the whole situation at their own level as well so you know sometimes uh, since we don't have knowledge about the situation and we don't know what kind of backup we have uh, at times it affects our confidence level as well so once we know that these are the things and these are the ways that we can go about it then i'm sure that half of the problems would be handled by females themselves and some way or the other i think we need to work on the addiction as well because most of the time i feel that it is alcohol which actually brews up the entire domestic violence event at the house so if we could uh, kind of build in these de addiction uh, campaigns i think into the society at the community level then i think that would also help the welfare of these families because looking at the indian setup and maybe in the, even in the world the, the alcohol driven males uh, kind of do more domestic violence than the others so if we could look at that angle as well then i think that might help as well thank you dr swati you know these uh, counseling and uh, all corrective measures uh, related to domestic violence has already always been social programs of the state governments uh, but now with this uh, quantum of uh, problems the social problems and the domestic violence quantum has gone up because of stress that covid as an epidemic has brought people dying at home people ill at home Uh, uh unable to really cope with the with the cost of uh, treatments and all uh, how do you see this uh, entire uh, psychosocial domestic counseling expand uh, still keeping keeping the social distance away so you would not expect patient people to go to the hospitals because you have to maintain the physical distance at the same time also keeping uh, privacy of uh, families absolutely i think it's a very valid point for that matter that you have made uh, because i think and i think uh, in that sense digital world is something that can uh, come to a rescue for that matter because this is something that we could leverage now and see if we could do a lot of video counseling or call counseling for these people where they could kind of access without uh, jeopardizing the social distancing norms that we have and secondly uh, you know the suicide level has also gone up if we look at it uh, especially during these pandemic time where people who have been diagnosed with uh, covid uh, have actually gone to extreme length and 
committed suicides or uh, their members in the family have committed suicide so that is something again so these mental issues uh, mental health issues i think and all these problems the kind of things that could be managed with counseling whether it's suicide whether it's domestic violence whether it's uh, information about other things i think counseling should be something that should be really taken up by a lot of support groups and the government as well where we could reach out to these people and give them information because till the time people don't have information and the right information because we are living in a world of social media where uh, if we look at these times where in before the virus could strike there were so many other kind of false information floating around on social media which was moving much faster than the virus i would say so somebody or the other when we are living in world like this where you have people floating all kind of uh, wrong information around i think you need to have a credible source of counseling uh, for these people where they know that they are getting the right counseling and somebody who can really hold their hands through the entire situation guide them and not just do counseling if they go to the extreme then they can guide them as to where to go and how to find other kind of legal services as well so i think there really needs to we need to have in the society some good credible counseling sources which could use video counseling or uh, phone calls or something where people could kind of latch on to in their times of distress and feel that this is the uh, cover point that we have these are the people that we could talk to and we could confide in and find the right solutions for our situation very true dr swati if uh, you recollect our indian prime minister has very rightly said that this is going to be now the world of digitalized services digitalization of businesses digital digitalization of economies to an extent so very rightly you said that the counseling services the health services also going digital because the needs have certainly become so enormous okay thank you so much dr swati i think we move to the next question is to mr anish kumar and the question is uh, from uh, sudhan shu malotra what should be done to alleviate distress uh, beyond uh, skilling uh, in terms of rural settings what is the distress in uh, village in so one uh, yeah. part of the distress is around uh, food the other part of this distress is around uh, income you see food government has announced expansion of uh, pds there is a section of uh, because of the requirement of aadhar seating and dbt uh, framework so there uh, there is a challenge of some left out families with the migrants returning there could be another set of uh, people who are left out so one we have to help people get included in the pds uh, net government has already announced it is uh, less the lifting is actually much less than uh, what government has announced by its own admission actually in, uh, they have made, they, uh, made public disclosure on the food being lifted so it is uh, much much less than uh, what they have provided for our uh, stocks the fci stocks are much higher so we have to push that and push it one at the government end the other is uh, make it compliant with the aadhar seeding so whenever one ration uh, card one nation happens so So that is one part. Second is uh, getting some cash in hand of people. The government is not of the view, and the fiscal width is not such that uh, we already have seen yesterday. Modi downgraded. So there, uh, the fiscal width is not there. So what will you do? So NRJS announcement is there, but NRJS announcement also, and I, many of the social activists are urging them to increase it, increase from hundred to two hundred. and whatever numbers we look at i presented some numbers so 5 and 1/2 crores only so and if you look at uh, 18 crore rural households and if there are more and you know people coming back from cities some of them would look for uh, this kind of uh, wage work some would not but some would so even if you are at a gross level also looking at 10 crore households you are looking to provide instead of 35 days 50 days you are looking at uh, not a very high number you are looking at close to about Hundred and thirty thousand odd crores. So government has provided whatever it has provided. It is saying it is about one hundred thousand odd crores. 
11,000 is area from last year. So, and you know, whatever numbers, so numbers is one part of it, but some num increase on NRAGS and its translation on the ground is the second part of the work. If cash transfer is not going to work, do with NRAGS. Third part is works. You see, works, what has, and you know, uh, in these kinds of situations, uh, pandemic, uh, drought, flood, what happens? You announce public works. So that is one complaint I have with this government. And given the fiscal bits also, and uh, the government, this government at least is known for its public works. We haven't seen any announcement of large scale public works. If we know the returning migrants, the last section is uh, in the construction sector. What kind of work we can announce? There is a n number of options there. There's Pradhan Mandri Awas Yojana is there. You see the rural infrastructure is, uh, we know the frontline health infrastructure. Already, for example, in Jharkhand, you will see, unlike other states, even the basic Anganwari tendras are not available to the extent of 40%. So there is a scheme in M MGNRGS. Can you imagine? We don't know about it. MGNRGS is funding creation of Anganwari tendras. And then, you know, Srinivas, some of the funds from PSU CSR and we have uh, deployed in the 35 aspirational districts that we are present, the left wing extremist 35 districts that we are present, we are deploying some of the funds from PSU CSR for construction of Anwar. So all this could be done. These are public works which would engage construction. But there is a scheme now, the 15th Finance Commission has announced a award for safe drinking water and sanitation. So public works, there is enough in the system itself and it has to be targeted for creation of public works, which will absorb the returning migrants from the construction sector into this and put money in the hand of people. There. Third is agriculture. So today, and you know, I explained about 60% is rainfed. Rainfed means Kharif is the most important crop. Fortunately, the IMD estimates are we are going to have good monsoons. Are we prepared? There has been disruption in the every input supply chain. There has to be some kind of effort around provision of inputs and fertilizers. We don't know in June you will hear, and in normal years we hear shortages, the cross-board shortages of seeds and fertilizers. Some states you hear people and you know farmers on road, some kind uh, of a disturbance writing around that. For Dr. Srinivas Shroff, uh, a quick question is that with the skilling that uh, you have suggested. This is Mr. Santosh Gupta asking a question, uh, saying as an expert of skilling, what do you think about migrants and how we can engage the migrants uh, into um, uh, full employment? Uh, let me see. Uh, and how we can engage most of them into regular employments? You know, it's, it's a loaded question, but um... Nevertheless, you know, the, the migrant, uh, the, the displaced laborers who have gone back, if you look at it uh, in the overall perspective of the total population, it's really not much. Uh, Three million in uh, UP, uh, 30 lakhs, in a total population of 23 crores, it's not really much. But it is a distress to these 30 lakh people for sure. So. What I mean, uh, this is a number which government is also working from, say, REC, what I said is, say, we take about two or three districts or five districts and just focus on the migrant workers, capitalize on their skill sets and give them a kind of a startup or a facility where they actually are able to start running their income. Because apparently 50% of the people who have gone back are kind of not showing interest to you know return but 50 percent apparently are likely to return so the numbers that we are talking is really not too huge but significant enough so it should be possible to help them out so i am uh, you know uh, we might very much get a guidance from uh, department of public enterprises especially the csrs they might even tell us each one of you you know uh, kind of support few districts the the public sector unit csrs so i see that whether that happens or not you know even uh, if uh, just csr or the state governments itself together i'm very sure the number is not surmountable uh, unsurmountable now we have the next week uh, webinar which is primarily going to bring uh, some of the best uh, speakers again uh, on mental health as well as 
on the economic front as well as uh, health sector economists. So the three speakers, again, we will be able to meet on the 9th of June, the same time on the same session. Uh, and uh, obviously we will take this further because there are so many issues about migrants that of course came up, the issues about social impact, which I think is, is much bigger than we see it. So I think we can probably carry some of the questions to the next session. That will be the last of this series of seven uh, technical and uh, social as well as uh, Im implementation practice webinars that have started off. And then we will take possibly a break of two weeks and then come back with now the, the field warriors who will then can start talking from different districts and different states about their experiences of how they have been coping with COVID especially if you look at the kind of distress, the psychological distress we heard in children, the distress we heard in domestic environments and distress we heard because of the, the loss of uh, wages. So with that, I think I wish to thank on behalf of Sambodhi, as well as the Secretariat that Kamila and uh, Anubrata for managing the entire uh, webinar series. So it's thank you to everybody, all the speakers, as well as the participants from all of us till next week when we meet again. So it's goodbye. Thank you.